Well, listen, well, aren't we just go ahead and jump right into the message this morning? We're in the second part of our ser- series called Family Matters. Last week, we talked about how to become the best me because the most important person I will ever lead in my family is me. And if I lead myself well, it really does help me lead my family well. Today, we're going to talk about a subject that is near and dear to all of our hearts. Uh, we're going to talk about how do we bring out the best in our kids. And this is actually a two part series. This morning, I'll I'll let you know we're going to kind of focus on those that are high school and younger and focus on what family structure looks like there and how we can bring out the best in our kids there. Uh, if you don't have a kid in that age category, I still need you to dial in because the parents are not the only influencers in kids that age. There needs to be adults that come along those parents that encourage them. And some of you are in a very young state in your parenting, and I believe that today will encourage you and help you. And then next week, we're going to talk about how do we parent adult kids, because I have come to learn this as a kid. I always need my mom, and I always need my parents. Uh, Their influence in my life, it changes, but it is still critical for the success that God wants to have and and accomplish through my life. So we'll do that. So let's begin this morning because this is an important truth, especially for the young parents in here. Uh, It it was a truth that really became evident when I graduated from high school. When I graduated, my mom and dad, they presented me with a a piece of luggage and a watch, and they said, baby, it's time to go Uh, because (laughs) because we have raised you to leave, not to stay. And that really should be the desire of every parent, that we want to raise our children in such a way that when they are ready to launch and they are ready to move into their own place of adulthood, they are well capable and that we have not just packed their bags with clean t-shirts and socks and shirts, but that we've packed their bags with some stuff that will carry them successfully throughout the life that God is calling them to live. Now, one of the verses I think that is really important for us to lean into this morning, and it's a great life verse that you can uh, uh, put on your refrigerator, it comes from Psalm chapter 90. Psalm chapter 90, the 90th division of the psalm, it was actually written by Moses, and it's the only psalm that we have recorded in the Bible that he wrote. And there's this great nugget of wisdom that he gives us. He says these words, it's there in your handout. He says, Lord, teach us to count our days so that we may have a heart of wisdom. Lord, teach us to count our days. Help us to be aware of the days that we have, the days that you have given us. Help us not to waste them, but help us to be intentional in these days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom so that we may impart this especially to our children. And now when we think about counting and math, one of the things we've learned in leadership is this, is it's very difficult to, to, to hear numbers, right? Uh, when you're getting a financial report, they, they always put the numbers on paper because numbers need to be seen more than they need to be heard. And so when we're talking about counting our days, I, I want to give you a visual because... The number of weeks, if you will, between the moment you had your child and the moment that your child is now ready to leave high school and launch into college or their career is about 1,000 weeks. 1,000 weeks from the time you have begun the labor process in the hospital to the time they walk across that graduation stage and they begin moving ahead into their life and where the shift of your parenting takes a huge turn. 1,000 weeks. You know, when you start and you think about it, that each one of these marbles represents one week. And there's really nothing I can do to keep these marbles from being removed from our life. They just come out. Week after week. It starts when they're children, and those weeks seem long, and then all of a sudden, before you know it, they're in middle school, and then before you notice that you find that they're off in high school. How many of you uh, have maybe a ninth grader here? Anyone here got kids in high school? Let me give you a picture of what that looks like. If you have a high school or ninth grader, this is what marbles you have left. That's it. About 200 marbles is all you have left once they get into high school. Now, some of you are thinking, 
thank God. But most of us look at this and go, wait a minute, I started with this and now I only have this. And I really need to make sure that I am counting my days, Lord, so that I might have a heart of wisdom. Because there are certain things that are going to happen in high school now uh, for all of our kids uh, because life happens in patterns. You know, in that first 10 weeks or so of high school, they're going to have to figure out how to navigate the new building and, and go from class to class and who's going to be in their tribe and who are going to be the students they hang out with and, and what are going to be... Uh, uh, where's, where are they going to sit in the classroom? Well, then about week 20, right, they're going to have their first final exams. And they're going to get this thing that's really going to direct so much of their life. It's called a GPA. And about that time, they're going to have to decide, is the Ivy League still in play or am I thinking more JUCO? You know, am I going to stay around here? Well, time just keeps going on. And then about week 50, something happens. Uh, it means that many of them will go and they will get their driver's license or their learning permit and some of them will fall out <laughs> along the way right about about week 50 their sophomore year in high school they're going to go get their, their, their to the dmv they're going to pass their test and your prayer life is going to increase substantially but these weeks are gone and then about week 70 you know what's going to happen they're going to go and they're going to get a job they're going to have their first paycheck and let me tell you it's not going to help you one little bit <laughs> Matter of fact, their paycheck may actually cost you money. But now things are really rolling. They make it to their junior year, and now you're in warp drive. Now your son is shaving. Now they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And now they're beginning to take their SATs. And for most of them, they're going to have to take them again. And then they're really looking at the fact there's nothing wrong with trade school. Maybe we need to go in that direction. And before you know it, they're in high school. It's their senior year, and they begin all their first last. The last time they'll start school. The last football game they'll attend. The last time they'll strap on a football helmet. Their last homecoming. And then in the spring, it comes and it hits. And now there's prom and there's spring break. And then before you know it, senior pictures and the kid walks out in the living room and says how do I look in my cap and gown and a week later they walk across there and all you discover is you've lost all your marbles <laughs> along the way <laughs> one thing we cannot change is the fact that time is going to pass like the, the sand of the hourglass, it will pass. But what is it that we can do in that time that we can be intentional as parents that we're helping our kids pack their bags well? Let me give you a couple of truths this morning as you are looking at your notes. Let me give you this because I believe this is an important truth right here. It is this. When you and I, when we see how much time we have left, we tend to get serious about the time we have now. When we see how much time we have left, we tend to get serious about the time we have now. And isn't it true, regardless of where we are in life, if it's a project on the job, if it's a deadline for school, if it's, if it's the, the two-minute warning in the football game, it's the fourth corner, now we got to get serious because time is running out. Here's the second truth I want you to jot down. When we see how much time we have left, we tend to value what happens over that time. When we recognize that this is a finite resource, then we realize that I need to leverage this time and we need to pray this, this prayer that Moses prayed, Lord, teach me to number my days so that I might have a heart of wisdom. I might be able to take this moment and I might be able to leverage it so well that I am helping my kid become their very best. I'm helping pack their bags so when they leave my home and they launch into the life that you've called them to in their own adulthood, Lord, that they are well able to begin to do that journey and they have a packed bag. So let me give you six words, six things that you and I uh, can do and should do as parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles. Just six words. Now, let's, let me tell you, I don't think any of them you're going to go, oh, wow, I never saw that one come in Bismore. You must have prayed for like days and days and went up Mount Sinai to get that. It's like, duh. Some of this feels kind of duh. 
and, and for many of us, we're doing it somewhat probably, if not intentionally, intuitive. But maybe this morning through this, this time that we have together around God's Word, maybe we can hone our focus and be a little more intentional. Because every week that passes, a marble leaves the jar. But we don't have to be afraid of it. For when that marble leaves, I'm putting something of greater eternal value in it that will outlast the marble. And the first word I want to talk to you about this is this. I want to talk to you about love. What your kid needs from you is love. And what I want to talk to you about is I want to talk about how all these words over time leverages the greatness of God in their life. Now, like I said, when you say, oh, my kid needs love, I know that, Tony, no doubt. We all need love, and our kids need love. But I want you to think about this. I want you to think about love over time. Not just love in a moment or in a statement or in one small expression here or there, you know, scattered and peppered throughout their life. I want to talk about how do we love our, our kids? How do we love their socks off them consistently over time? And the way I want to frame this and I ask you to think about it is think about how you know the love of God. You don't know the love of God simply because there's a Bible verse that tells you that God loves you. Though we have that. You don't have the love of God just because of one moment or not. You know the love of God in your life because of the consistent pursuit of God to you in life. If you stop and think about it, some of you were far, far from God. You were going off the rails. You were making decisions that had devastating consequences for your life, for those in your circle. And there were decisions and, and consequences that you were having to face. And a lot of people bailed out on you. But what you discovered over time is that God didn't, that God kept pursuing you, that God kept loving you, that God kept affirming you. He kept drawing you in until there came a moment when you surrendered that love. And it wasn't because you heard one passage of Scripture. It was love over time that was leveraged over time that gave you this and what your kids need. This real sense of worth. See, love over time equates to worth. I want you to jot that down. Because what happens is when we love our kids and we love them consistently, and we love them with our words and our actions and that we are present in their present moments, we are saying to them through our expressions of love, your life has tremendous value. And if we pause and we think about our Father in heaven, the way that He has pursued us and loved us and cared for us, what it ultimately says is that our life has great worth to Him. And there is a longing in all of our lives to know that our life has value and meaning and purpose. And when we love our kids, we are instilling in them this overwhelming sense of love. And I want to talk to you, and I just want to remind you of this great verse in 1 Corinthians 13. It's the love chapter. We, we all know it. But I just want you to think about it not as this moment, not as this day, Valentine's, that we're saying love, but over time, what this must mean. That love over time is patient. And, pay, and love is kind over time. Not just when everything in the family is going well. Not when they're just uh, lined up and in marching orders. But it's kind. That love isn't, doesn't envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It doesn't dishonor. But even to our children, we offer them honor and respect because love over time leverages this truth of worth. Love does not delight in evil. It rejoices in truth. Love protects at all times and over time. Love trusts at all times and over time. Love hopes at all times and over times. And ultimately, love wins. It perseveres. It never fails. So as you're working through your marbles and you feel like you're losing your marbles, remember, love over time is putting in your kid's suitcase, my life has worth. Here's the second word I want to give you is this. It's the word words. Words. Be intentional with your words. 
Research tells us that the average teenager today hears one word of affirmation for seven words of criticism. The words that you speak to your children are powerful, especially if they're in that middle school, high school time frame. One middle school teacher said this to me. She said, Tony, there's no way you can over-affirm a middle schooler. The Bible tells us that life and death are in the power of our tongues. And what we want to do is we want to speak words into our children over time that bring forth life, but not just life. They give direction to their life. Uh, many of you may have watched or were, were raised like I was with Mr. Rogers, the Mr. Rogers neighborhood. Remember that? You know, I, I know we feel like it's just kooky and weird and just crazy and it doesn't. I'm telling you, the impact of that show is remarkable. There's been so much academic research about what that show meant to children. And it wasn't that he was just so, uh, nice and soft. As they researched this, they discovered adults who said it was the words he empowered me with that made the biggest difference in my life. Because he was great about helping kids put words to their feelings. Oh, that must make you fearful. Oh, I bet that really makes you angry. Oh, I bet you really want to get revenge. Oh, I bet that really made you happy. And I bet that left you with a lot of questions. And all these words allowed the kids, these kids that became adults who looked back and said it was so impactful because those words gave me words to frame the direction of my life and the relationships that I now have to navigate as an adult. I know how to sort through my emotional frustration. I know how to sort through my anger. I know how to use words now and recognize this is what I'm feeling and this is the direction I need to take this relationship with my wife or on the job or with my own children. Words that we speak matter. And words spoken well over time will pack in your kid's bag direction. Words over time will equal direction in your kid's life. Words over time. Listen to these words from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Listen, my son, accept the words that I say, and the years of your life will be many. I instruct you in the ways of wisdom and lead you along a straight path. Mom and dad, I think one of the greatest gifts you can give your children is to develop a safe place in your home where they can sit down and they can share their words. And you can share your words. Uh, we live in somewhat of a public environment as a pastor of a, of a pretty good-sized church. But Trisha and I decided that we were going to have a moat around our home because we wanted to protect a place for our kids where they could come and they could come and share and they could talk about what made them angry and what made them upset and the questions of their faith and the uncertainty of their friends and, and why they felt like they were betrayed and all those things. And one of the most important things I've watched my wife do at times, she'll, she'll ask them, what's going on in your heart? Give me some words. Words over time. Equal direction. Let me give you another one. The third one is this, stories. I love this one. Your kids need stories. Stories over time. You know, we think too often that people learn out of information and precepts. But what we discover is we all learn much better through stories. When you think about how Jesus taught, he did not teach a ton of precepts that were just standalone precepts. He was always teaching through stories. We refer to them as parables because they paint a word picture. See, information tends to be emotionally neutral. But stories bring us in emotionally to the moment. And stories help us to develop empathy and perspective that is not this perspective that maybe just information gives us. J.K. Rollins, who wrote Harry Potter's 
uh, great work. She made this statement. I think it's really true. She says, the human species is the only species that can imagine itself in someone else's shoes. See, that's what stories do. They help give us perspective. They help develop empathy. They help us understand what's going on. It paints us not just with information, but it paints us with emotional connection that helps our kids begin to frame a world that's not just data, it's not just binary, but it is compassionate and it is merciful. Stories connect us emotionally. And research shows us that our brains respond to stories. Listen to this. Research shows us, neurologists have passed this out, that stories impact us in the brain function differently than just information. And wouldn't our world look different today if instead of just being an information age, we were an empathetic age? And that we could be compassionate and merciful. And this is key to our faith. See, if we're not careful, then this book just becomes a book of facts and a book of informations and a book of do's and do nots. But God didn't give us a recipe book. God gave us the story of his people. God gave us the story of broken people that leaned into him and their life was altered and changed forever. What are the stories that you're telling your kids? Because if we're not telling these stories honestly and and directly, then maybe we're not really painting the picture of what faith looks like in their life. Maybe they think of their faith more like felt more Jesus that they learned about in children's church, but now that they're 18, they're 20, they're 22, oh, that's just fables. Those are just stories. They don't really work because those people are. Have you ever just stopped and thought about how whacked most of the people in the Bible are? I mean, honestly, have you ever done that? Let me ask you this. Um, How many of you can point to a family in the Bible that you would like to emulate? It's like, man, if my family could turn out like that, I'm all in. Show me how to do that. Adam and Eve, is that where you want to begin? Aren't they the source of all of our dysfunction? And one of their kids killed their... Oh, that's a mess. Noah? How about Noah? Well, yeah, it starts well. He saves his family, but there comes a point where he had too much to drink and not enough clothes on. It's a really messy story. Don't even want to go there. How about Jacob and Esau? You want that family? A conniving mom, a naive father, sibling rivalries that last a lifetime? How about Joseph and his loving brothers? You want that one? Well, what about the Holy Family? You know, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Oh, that's what we want. Really? I mean, they go to church and they leave him at church for three days before they even recognize he's there. You know, if children's family services were around back then, it's like, uh, Jesus is now in the custody of the state temporarily. And even when Jesus got older, you remember his family? They thought he was crazy and they wanted to institutionalize him. Matter of fact, the more I read about the families in the Bible, the more I like my family, if I'm honest with you. They need to know these stories. They need to know the story of our faith. They need to know the story of your faith. In Deuteronomy, you see that passage there. I won't, I'll, I'll quote it. I won't quote it exactly, but close enough that you get what I'm trying to say here. As Moses is getting ready to sign off, the book of Deuteronomy is a collection of his final thoughts and instruction to the children of Israel after leading them for 40 years. And he says, listen, there's going to come moments as mom and dads when you're going to be walking down the path and your kids are going to say, why do we go to church? Why do we have to go to Sunday school? I don't like being there. My friends don't go. They're going to ask you, why are you so committed to them? He says, and when that happens, you've got to tell them the story. The story isn't because it's Sunday and that's just what we do. The story is how God met you in your brokenness and changed your world. Oh, I remember those questions when my kids were young. Uh, why do you have to go? 
I mean, why'd you have to be a pastor, Dad? This is not fair. We have to be there. It's like, okay, let's sit down and talk about that. See, Chandler, Taylor, there was a time when your dad wasn't a pastor. There was a time when your dad wasn't even a Christian. And there was a time in my life where I did everything I could not to be in church and to get away from God. But that God pursued me. And he found me in my spiritual Egypt. And he brought me out of that place. And he forgave me of my sins. And I was at West Georgia University kneeling in a dorm room when Christ brought me out. When he forgave my sins and he gave me a new start. This is not ritual for me. This is not just what I do because it's my job description. I do this because it is a story of God written in a broken vessel and how He brought me out when I simply leaned into Him. And your kids have got to know those stories. It connects them emotionally with this. See, stories over time give perspective. One of the things that we needed to do with stories is to help our kids understand this that the rest of the world does not look like Oconee County. We needed to tell them the story of the rest of the world. Because we realized that story over time will help them have perspective that their world isn't the center of the universe. And that leads us to this next one. The next one I want to give you is quickly and is you got to have some fun. I want you to put fun in there. Fun. Now, for some of you, uh, uh, this may be the most spiritual thing you'll be able to do with your kids. Uh, you, this will make, listen, you want to know how to make your home attractive to your teenagers? You want to know how to make your home attractive to their friends? You want to know how to make a church attractive to teenagers? it's got to have a lot of fun going on. If it's not fun, they won't come. And for some of us, we spend so much time trying to fix our kids that we never have fun with our kids. Listen to these passages. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. Laughter does good like medicine, right? Well, we, we think about it. laughter does good like medicine. Here's another one. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. The joy of the Lord is our, say it, strength. Is it possible? Could we do this? Could we measure the health of our family by the amount of laughter in our home? Is it possible to determine how strong our family is based on the joy that is experienced in our home? Is there a place where you just belly laugh? where you just giggle, that you just have a good time, that, that there's nothing on the agenda. It's just fun. Now, for some of us, it's like, oh, that will be so hard because I'm not a fun person. Your kid needs you to be a fun person. They need you to laugh. They need you to joke around. They need you to do your best dance. They need, they need you to have fun with them. Here's why. Let me tell you why it's so important. Because fun over time will reconnect them when they get disconnected from you. Fun over time. Because yes, our job is not to be their friends. Our job is to be their parents. But being a parent doesn't mean we're some drill sergeant. It means that we engage them at the deepest emotional levels possible. And part of that is just having a good time. See, fun over time, listen, parents, authenticates forgiveness in their life. Because there are going to be times when they blow it and you've got to forgive them. And when you're having fun with them, you know what you're doing? You're authenticating the fact they're forgiven. Because you don't have fun with people that you haven't forgiven. Can I get an amen there? You tell me one person in your life where you have not forgiven them and you enjoy hanging out and having fun with them. There's no one like that. Put fun in the journey. See, fun over time equals to connection. 
Fun over time equals connection. So here's your job today. You need to go home and schedule something fun. Just have a good time. No agenda, just fun. You're not going to try to teach them something. You're not going to try to give them some life principle. You're just going to have fun. And too often, I think as parents, we're so focused on fixing our kids, we miss having fun with our kids. Here's the fifth one. Two more and we'll be out of the way. Number, three, number five is this, is work. Work. Such an important word. Such an important word, not just for their future, but for the kingdom of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we are God's handiwork. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. What you do impacts what you believe. I want to jot that down. What I do impacts what I believe. If we tell our kids, your life is significant, and God has a great plan for your life, but we never put anything significant in their hand to do, then they're not going to believe that their life is truly significant. If, if we speak the positive platitudes, God's got a remarkable purpose for your life. He's got gifts and talents and abilities in you that He is going to use, yet we never give them a platform by which to engage that and to do something significant in their life. They will not believe that their life truly is significant. Students need something significant to do. To live beyond themselves. And especially when they get out of elementary school, when it's all about me and it turns to we, we begin to share with them, this is how you can live your life significantly in service to others. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, one of the things Trisha and I wanted to do, as we were so thankful that we were able to raise our children in, in Oconee County and all the benefits and all the privileges that come with that, we also wanted them to understand to whom much has been given, much is required, and the rest of the world does not look like Oconee County. And we, we sent them on missions trips. We sent them to, to food kitchens. We, we sent them to pack uh, uh, lunches for the homeless and the needy. We sent them to look and see that there there is something that God has placed in you that you can serve others. And in serving others, your life finds significance. And this is the work that God ultimately wants to do through you is to impact someone else's life regardless of what the job title may ever say. Because God has called you to significance. So yeah, here at Grace Fellowship, we look for ways to help them become significant. Did you know that this morning in our broadcast media team, most of them up there are teenagers. That we have a worship team of teenagers. They work in guest services. Why? Because we believe that if we, be if we truly believe that kids can have a significant life, we need to put something significant in their hands now and affirm that and build that and release that. Listen, friends, it's not enough for us just to win our neighbors or the nations. we got to win the next generation. And one way we do that is we put work in their hands over time and it builds significance in their life. And finally is this. Let me give you this. It's tribe. It's tribe. This is an important one. Tribe. This is a biblical word. This is the people in which God calls you to be a part of. And if there's one thing we all long for, we long to belong. We want to belong to something. We want to know one another and we long to be known. And God has called the body of Christ to be a tribe where you can raise your family. And you can encourage them and you can learn how to love them better. How to laugh with them more dynamically. How to work. And it is the tribe because parents, listen, Trish and I learned this and I'm not saying by any means we're great parents. We're doing the best we can and the Lord's been gracious to us. But we recognize one of the greatest assets we could have is other parents in our kids' lives that we could not parent our kids alone. That yes, our influence in our kids' life was remarkable, but it was not the only influence that they needed. Because there comes a time when our voice gets muted to all the other voices in the culture. And when that time came, we wanted to make sure that we had surrounded our kids with other adult voices in student ministry, in children's ministry, in church world, 
that would begin to echo the same message they had been hearing from us. And you know what happens sometimes? The message that we had been speaking for years never seemed to ring true, but all of a sudden they go over to Bob's house, and Bob's dad says this, and now you're driving down the road, and your kid says, well, you know, Bob's dad said this, and you're going, really? You're buying it now? I've been saying that for 14 years, and Bob's dad says it one time, and you're bought in? Yes. And that, that adult student leader at the church who shows up week in and week out, it builds a tribe. See, what I'm saying is you don't have to do this alone and you shouldn't do this alone. Increase your circles for your family. See, let, let me end with this. I, I can't control the fact that I've got a thousand weeks. A thousand weeks. You know, that first week, Chandler was born, Taylor was born. Well, I'm telling you, it was just a blur and it was gone that quick. Matter of fact, the first several weeks, I don't know if I slept. But what I do know is they're gone. And then we're at 14 weeks and we finally got a night's sleep. And then it keeps going on. And then something happens. We stop telling how old our kids are by weeks, right? And we begin to count them by months. And so now our kid isn't five weeks old. Now they're five months old. And the whole time, more and more of these beads are just flying out. And it's like, oh my goodness. And here's what I know. At the age of two years old, it's tough. It's difficult. The days are long. But there comes a moment where they're gone. And you know what will happen? I'll never see Chandler again at two years old. Stone. And three years old. And four years old. And then they're in, then they're in elementary school. And, and I go to their first singing. And before I know it, that moment is gone. And then I go to middle school. And I get into middle school. And, and, and I'll only know him as a 10th grader one year. And I'll never do that again. And then he's 12. And thank God I'll never know him again as a 12-year-old. And, and now we're in high school. And, and it's just weeks and weeks and weeks gone. And, and now they're driving. They're dating. We have fights. We have good times. But before I know it, what happens? They're all gone. It's gone. And he's walking across and I hear Dr. Brown at North Oconee say, Anthony Chandler Vismore. And I look back and I say, Oh, that was Yellowstone. That family vacation. Oh, here's Taylor's First homecoming dance. But instead of mourning this, what I discover is now as they pack their bags, they say, Dad, I'm gone. I'm going off to college. I'm moving on. There's something more in their bag than socks and underwear and a few dollars in their bag that we have packed because we have asked God to number, help us number our days is there is worth and there is connection and they realize their significance and they understand the importance of being connected and belonging to a church. And we look back and we say, God, though we weren't perfect, thank you that by your grace you helped us number our days, that we may obtain a heart of wisdom so that our kids may have a bag that's full of that which really, really matters.